Hi everyone, so the service I'll be using today is called Flux Pulit. This allows you to take just a single image to create character consistency. So this essentially means that you don't need to train any LoRa's. You simply just take an image of someone's face. It's going to generate another image referencing that likeness, which means that you can change the items of clothing or even the lighting scenario. So without further ado, let's get started. So I'll be using Flux Pulit on Replicate and in order to use that, you are going to need a GitHub account. So you just want to go to github.com and then go to sign up if you don't have an account. Once you've signed up, you want to go to this website, which is replicate.com and then you'll click on sign in and you'll see as soon as you click on sign in, you'll be able to sign in with your GitHub. Now check the link in the description, which will take you straight over to Flux Pulid. So if you head over to the link in the description, it'll bring you over to Flux Pulit. And I do need to mention right now that this is a paid service. If you're using it on Replicate, you can see over here, it gives you an estimation of how much it's going to cost to actually run this. But you can see it's extremely cheap. If you guys want to use it for free, you can access it on Hugging Face. The link is also in the description. Uh, but you are going to have a limitation here. You can only generate, I think, like just a couple images. Uh, but you can test it on Hugging Face for free as well. So watch this tutorial and whatever settings that I've applied on Replicate, you can basically use the same settings on Hugging Face. But the tutorial will continue using Replicate. So the best use case for Pulit, in my opinion, is using custom generated humans. So people that don't exist. And that's because with Pulit, I think it's actually interpreting the images you're supplying it. And because we're using a single image, it's not doing a 100% accurate transfer of the likeness. There is some minor differences or some subtle changes in the face that you will notice. But if you're using a custom generated character, right? We don't have to compare them to anyone else, right? It's not like we need the exact likeness of a celebrity, whatever. It's this person is custom generated. So even if it alters the face just a little bit, we can still run with that and still use those images. And that's why I used it for this custom generated uh, model, uh, for this black model. And I wanted to see her in a different setting. I did it as well for the Asian model, just to see how it holds up. And I think it holds up really well. But if you pay very close attention, you can see some minor differences in the face. But because it's a custom character, I think it still works perfectly fine. So another use case, which was quite experimental, was taking iconic paintings and then using Pulid to turn them into realistic people. And this is exactly how I created this realistic version of the Mona Lisa, which I actually used to train a Laura. So that actually really came in handy. But you can see Pulid is interpreting this and then creating a realistic version using all of her facial features and even the hair and all of that. And I think it does a great job. And because we don't know what the Mona Lisa actually looks like, we don't have real photography of her. Even if there's minor changes in the face, it doesn't really matter that much, right? I think the end result looks amazing. I even tried it with the girl with the pearl earring and got some different results over here as well. So yeah, that's something that you can play around with. So I tried this as well with historical figures and celebrities, and I think this is where it gets a little bit tricky because we actually have something to reference. There's pictures of these people online that we can see. We've seen them in movies and all of that. We know what they look like, right? So we can scrutinize these images and actually notice differences. I did try this with Albert Einstein. Now the images generated, they definitely look like Albert Einstein, but there is some noticeable differences as well. But I think it still holds up quite well. I tried it with Nikola Tesla using this black and white image. And finally, I can get Nikola Tesla driving a Tesla, <laughs> which I thought was quite funny. Uh, but you can see it's transferring over his hairstyle and his mustache. But if you pay close attention, you can still notice some differences, right? It's not an exact copy of the likeness. And I think that's because it's restric restricted to just using one image. I even tried this with uh, Angelina Jolie. And again, the images generated of Angelina Jolie, they definitely look like Angelina Jolie, but it looks like someone that looks like an Angelina Jolie, Angelina Jolie, like a doppelganger of some sort. Uh, but yeah, this is where I think you actually start noticing that it's not an exact copy of the face. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to show you how it holds up with historical figures and celebrities as well. And if you're doing, you know, celebrities, well, use it responsibly or maybe just do it for your own personal use. So I tried this with my own likeness and obviously this is when I'm going to be the most critical because I know what I look like, obviously. And yeah, no, nah, this did not work at all using my own likeness. This is a completely different person and this is where I found it to be at its weakest. 
In case you're wondering, no, you can't use products, animals, or even stylized faces like anime or something like that. And that's because this is obviously trained on transferring over realistic looking human faces. But I did want to mention that. Okay, so let's actually use Pulet. So for the purpose of this tutorial, I'll be using this image of the Mona Lisa. So on Pulet, when you uh, scroll down over here, you'll see that there's a main face image. Just click on this icon over here, which says you can choose a file from your machine. And then all you need to do over here is just drag and drop the image into this section over here and it'll upload the image for you. Right, so now you just want to scroll down until you see the prompt section. So what I've noticed from prompting, uh, even though you know that it, it analyzes the image and it looks at the face and it's going to transfer it over, being a little bit more descriptive in your prompt, I think helps with the image generation. So in this case with the Mona Lisa, this was the prompt that I used. So I'm obviously describing the type of weight I want it to be. So I said she's slightly overweight. I said she's going to have medium length, wavy, a light brown hair right? Like in the image itself. I said she's a 30 year old adult female just to dictate her age. She's got dark brown eyes. It's a portrait. And then I also uh, left in color. And then I said cinematic. And then I'm also specifying what she's wearing and where she's actually wearing it. So she's wearing a white t-shirt and she's going to be wearing a white t-shirt in a field of flowers. You can also add to the prompt to dictate the time of day. So you can even say she's wearing it in a field of flowers at sunset. So now that you get a different lighting scenario. So with regards to the other settings, I'm actually leaving the majority of these on default. So I'm not touching anything over here until the number of outputs. So this is basically telling you how many images you wanted to generate. I'm actually going to leave that on two. And then you want to click on this section over here. Right, click on the arrow, it'll give you a drop down menu. And now you can see we've even got a negative prompting section. So these are things you don't want to be visible in the final image. So I leave that by default. And now there's, a, there's an option over here called the start step integer. So this is probably the setting for me that's the most important one over here. And if you scroll down, all right, it does give you a description right over here of what this is doing so that you can understand it a lot better. But I am going to show you a visual example, right? So let me scroll back up. That is right over here by start step integer. So with the start step integer, I'm going to bring up an image over here. You can see this is a time step and it's telling you that zero to four is recommended because on zero, we're going to have the highest fidelity with probably where the image is going to look the most accurate and like the actual reference image. And as this number increases, you can see it's obviously still retaining that likeness, but now we've got elements of the hair that start changing. So it adds more creativity or editability into the image. So it depends what type of look you're going for. For me personally, I always just leave it on zero because I want the original hairstyle and I want the likeness and everything to be as close as possible to my source image. All right, so I would just leave that on zero and that would be good to go. I'm not changing anything by the seed or even this, the true CFG number. And the only thing I change here is I change this to PNG and the output quality, I would put that all the way up to a hundred. So once you've got all of those settings enabled, right? You've got your image and you've got your prompt, just click on run and it'll start generating a new image for you and a new uh, image identity using this image. All right, and just like that, we've got a realistic version of the Mona Lisa, which I think looks incredible. She's got her wavy hair. All right, the likeness that it carried over, I think it does a fantastic job. And like I mentioned earlier, we don't have real photos of the Mona Lisa. So even if there's minor differences in this image, it doesn't matter, right? This to me still looks like the Mona Lisa, a realistic modern version. She's in a field of sunflowers. She's wearing a white t-shirt. And you can see I put it on two outputs. And this looks incredible, right? I think it does a fantastic job uh, with images like this. So remember, this is using Flux and Flux has very good prompt adherence and great image quality. So you can be quite descriptive with your prompts. And I'm actually going to adjust this prompt right now and then show you the images that it generates. Okay, so I've left everything the same from here, but from here onwards, I actually added more context to this prompt and I made this a lot more complicated to show you how well Flux actually does, or uh, you know, holds up with prompt adherence. So I said she's going to be wearing a blue bomber jacket with patches, a red beanie and black sunglasses. She has a green parrot on her shoulder and she's holding a black sign with the text written in white that says Mona Lisa. So I'm going to click on run and I'll show you the end result. 
Okay, so there we go. The Mona Lisa, just like in the prom, she's wearing the red beanie. There's a green parrot. There's a blue jacket in this case. I think this one looks more like a bomber jacket, but it's definitely got patches on it. She is wearing uh, those black sunglasses. She is holding a black sign with the text written in white that says Mona Lisa. So you can see prompt adherence is very, very good. So if you want to take someone and, you know, you want to be very descriptive with their outfit, whatever you see in that image, you can do that with Flux because it works very, very well. And now just one more tip, if you've generated images, in this case I've got two images generated, and let's say I really like this image and its composition and the way her head is placed and the flowers and all of that, I can basically grab the seed of this image and generate a variation of it. So to do that, whenever these images are generated, over here by the log, uh, you'll see over here you've got using seed. So the seeds are basically from the first image at the top all the way down to the last one that gets generated. So I want this seed. So I'll control C and then on the left hand side over here we have seed integer. So I place the seed number in here and then maybe I can just adjust the prompt. So maybe I can say she's wearing a black t-shirt right instead of white and it's going to basically put a black t-shirt on her now while respecting the composition and like I said the pose and all of that. And I'll click on run and I'll show you what that looks like. So there we go, there's the comparison uh, with using the same seed. Now it is changing it a little bit obviously, uh, but still, I mean the composition's the same, the flowers are in the background, the t-shirts just change. I mean it's a different type of t-shirt, but that seed can come in handy if you want to lock in a particular image as composition that you really like. So this is where I think Pulit is extremely powerful. It's because now I can take one image, generate multiple images, like over here I've got close-up shots, I've got some medium torso shots, you know, with different lighting, different clothing, and this allows me to create an entire data set that I can use to train a LoRa. And the reason why I would maybe want to create a LoRa from this is because now once I have a LoRa created, I can use, you know, some free open source a software like Forge or Comfy UI, and then I can generate an infinite amount of images using that LoRa. So this is just a fantastic way to create a data set. And I'm just showing you a quick example of this one that I used to train a realistic Mona Lisa. Now some of these images even have different facial expressions, and over here I used Advanced Life Portrait in Comfy UI. There's tutorials about that on YouTube. It allows you to change facial expressions on images, and some of these images the character is in completely different poses, which adds even more variety to the data set. And over here, I used a service on Replicate by this person called FOFR, and it's called Consistent Character that allows you to upload an image, then it will generate another image with the likeness, but in different poses. So again, adding more variety to my data set. And yeah, this is just obviously something additional. If I wanted to train a LoRa, I think Pulid is fantastic for doing exactly that. Okay, so that's going to be the end of this tutorial. Now, you guys go ahead and play around with this. If you've played around with certain settings and you're getting, you know, results that look a lot more accurate to your source image, then feel free to share that in the comments so that we can all benefit from knowing how these sliders and these settings can be adjusted to make things look more accurate. But I, I still think the fact that you can take one image and generate multiple images, you know, with different clothing and lighting, that alone is incredible. And the fact that you don't have to use, you know, like a LoRa or install software or do anything else, you just go onto one website, you pay a small fee, and you can generate a whole bunch of uh, different images. That is amazing. So you guys, let me know what you think about Pulid in the comments down below. And as always, thank you so much for watching my videos and tutorials. Stay tuned for some more videos and tutorials, and goodbye.